youth football. They weren't with the automobile analogy uh, because the research comes from the automobile field and the military field. Only recently do you see more of the uh, specific. So if you, are, if you want to go buy your car, you have to pass FMVSS 208. So front impact, 214 is the side impact. These are pass-fail thresholds. But what we'll look at are the star ratings, the end cap. So if you go buy a car on the windshield, it's how many stars. Uh, this is interesting because the star rating actually came out of the National Academy of Sciences back in the 70s. So sitting in this room having the same discussion. But end cap is, it's rather complicated. Uh, it looks at head, neck, chest, and femur. They're all these put together into one equation to get total risk and multiplied by fractions, which are basically the exposure. Five twelfths of the time you're in a frontal car accident. So the star is rated to how often you're in that accident. Um, the number then decides whether or not you have a five-star car. And a five-star car is 10% less, 10 less risk of serious injury. All right, so talk about thresholds. Thresholds are defined values of risk. Uh, and are for a cost, it's 10% or less. So one out of 10 people in that accident will have a serious injury. People die in five-star cars, but your risk is lower. And then you're down to four-star, three-star, and two-star. Question, did that make any difference? Did this end cap on vehicles make a difference? In the 70s, when end cap started, we had about 44,000 fatalities on the road every year. Uh, seven cap started. Uh, we know that when you put side end cap, we're currently about 30,000 fatalities per year. That is not normalized for the fact that there's much more people driving much further than we were in the 70s. So when you look at the cap, you have to conclude it had a dramatic improvement. Cars got stiffer, better padding, better restraints, and people are doing much better. So the end cap actually worked very well. that, And if you look at most of the researchers, specifically the biomechanics, we're still arguing about every one of these criteria. Here there's a paper on whether or not HIC is good for car crashes. J for the neck, chest, femur loads. We're doing continually more and more research to advance this. So 100% about every one of these, but we know it makes some differences. The one thing we'd all agree on is when you look at loading the human body, accelerations and loads are decreased, your injury is decreased. And that's a fundamental part of, of any biomechanics. The helmets and protective equipment, I want to be very clear uh, about one thing, and that is that helmets are not the answer. They're not total solution. Uh, we talk about three things, and the first two are rules changes and proper technique, coaching. Uh, Dr. Quitz, I think, is going to follow this presentation with much more information on that, and those are critically important. What we talk about as engineers and biomechanists is the equipment part of it. Does equipment help? Can it be part of the solution? And, and, and our philosophy is if you have the right rules, if you have the right te technique, you have the best equipment, that you have the fewest number of concussions, and that's what we promote. I'm going to focus just on helmet. In 20, can't go into mouth guards and neck protectors and everything else that's out there. So I'll give you an example for helmets, but the same philosophy I would use to apply to every single protective equipment. We'll talk about age very quickly, so you want to all be on the same page. The OM goes up to 21 years. Uh, at helmets, basically there's two types, youth are 13 and below and it was 14 and above. And the answer is, what is that relative to types of play? So elementary, middle school, and then you have high school, college. But the interesting thing is, Gwen brings in some of your NFL players. A lot, there are quite a few NFL players who play at the 21-year age group. Uh, so the total breadth of the ages we're looking at, quite broad. These fundamental three questions. Uh, acceleration correlated uh, with concussion risk. I'm going to give you 60 years of research summarized, and I, I think uh, a, a better idea of what I'm trying to get at. A set of, of data, if we look historically, biomechanically. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of animal, specifically primate data. There's a lot of data from the NFL, and there's a lot of what we call volunteer data. So we have data. This is what we talk about most often. And it goes back to the auto safety world. Wayne State, Gurdjian and Listener in 61 did some of the first tests to start uh, state tolerance curve. Again, was at General Motors, had GSI and SSI. Hachi back at Ford, Tick in 71. So these are almost 40, 50 years ago. More recently, Mertz and Hart did some very interesting work looking at human cadavers. Uh, Mertz did some skate techniques where he looked at risk of skull fracture and risk of brain injury. 
be able to show uh, that these scale and they are proportional to risk. Uh, what are the things I'm talking about? So if we look at a hick of 1,000, for example, a risk of skull fracture is 16%. Let's say you drop that to 700, uh, which is the current suggestion, that drops your risk down to 5%. Brand is 4 and above, 17 to 4%. So think about 1,000 or 700 as a threshold, their de definition for risk. And we often assume more risk than people realize when we talk about federal standards. More recently, uh, in 2007, Hardy instrumented human cadavers and subjected them to football-like tests uh, by using neutral density targets so he could understand strain relative to football impacts, and this is high-speed biaxial x-ray. And as accelerations increase, the brain pressure and motion uh, increase. And at, from the cadaver data is, is after, as rotational accelerations increase, the brain pressures and the brain motions and the risk of injury, specifically skull fracture, increase all based on about 30 human cadaver heads. Now, look that to the primate work, which is in over 200 primate tests. If you want to get brain injury, you need an in vivo model. So there's been some amazing work uh, for decades uh, looking at primate tests and head injury. Uh, the first which was 66 with Amaya. I've summarized here what, I'll, what I grew from as six sets of, of primate tests. Amaya in 66, then you had Generelli, Amaya, and Tebow in the 70s. Owned in Japan in the 1980s, then another set by General and Tebow in the 80s, and then Hudson uh, in 83. So there's a tremendous amount. I'm not going to go into all the specific nuances, rotation. I'm going to present these as there's a tremendous amount of data. And so I want to focus on more recent people went back and analyzed the data. Uh, so Margulies, uh, Arbogast, Generelli, uh, and Davidson. So back to try to summarize and make sense of all these uh, primate tests. On this curve, where we looked at rhesus monkeys, chimpanzees, and then he scaled to concussion man. This is rotational velocity and rotational acceleration. And he recommended about 4,100 radians per second squared is where he would scale the primate data for humans. If we look at uh, a couple of papers by Jarelli, and these are really the classic primate tests, uh, scale look at different kinds of concussion, mild, classical, and severe, from 3,000 to 4,500 to 8,000. And then you get the DAI, okay, the more severe brain injury. And that's where you allow the other work, specifically Dr. Margulies looking at DAI, 16,000. So DAI, much more serious brain injury. We're not seeing this, fortunately, uh, in sports. But what you see is as you walk down this, again, we have rotational velocity, rotational acceleration. Here's the number. So it's playing at a lower amount of energy, lower amount of rotation and acceleration than the DAI. And that makes sense uh, from what you expect. So if we look at our primate data, again, put aside all the differences between each of them, rotational accelerations increase, brain injury in primates increases. More really, uh, we just, most people would call the NFL data. Now, this is 90s to the present. The NFL has done an extensive amount of research reconstructing concussion of the field, running into each other to, to understand uh, what the accelerations are relative to what NFL football players feel. Uh, specific studies, 2003, Pellman and Dr. King analyzed these. Uh, Dr. King looked at 30, 53 cases, 22 injuries, 31 non-injury, and he statistically significant correlation. As acceleration goes up, the risk of concussion goes up. As acceleration goes up, the risk of concussion goes up. Uh, very, very highly significant. Pell's risk functions included a few more cases, 58 cases, uh, and statistically significant. So if you look linear and rotation acceleration increasing, the risk concussion increases. It's, there's a significant correlation to concussion risk. Moving 2003 to the present, what I've called the volunteer data, this is working at instrumenting high school and college players and now youth players with sent on their heads to understand what kind of head acceleration they're seeing. A huge data set. There's basically two systems. Uh, most of the studies use the commercially available HIT system from Simbex, six accelerometers, three linear, and a result rotational. Used in parallel, a six degree of freedom, which is a 12 accelerometer system. It's a more expensive, uh, but over time we've been able to show that the very expensive 12 accelerometer array gives the same answers as a six array HITs, so we feel confident in this data. 
is a plot to show the magnitude of volunteer data that we have. So in 2003 and 2004, North Carolina and Oklahoma joined on. And then you have all these schools. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years we've been collecting data on these football players. One million impacts on human volunteers. So that relative to 30 cadavers, 200 primates, 53 reconstructions, 2 million impacts. That's an unbelievably large number to have as a data set. So what is that? Two months ago, we published a paper in ABME where we looked at, at risk functions. So we generate this risk equation where we have rotational acceleration and your acceleration. You always have both. You always have linear and you always have rotation. They come in different amounts depending on the hit, hit but it's a logical thing to include both in any kind of risk estimate. And we can the NFL data and the hit data to give you the most robust predictor of injury. So in rotation from the NFL and the volunteer. Two different technologies. NFL is running dummies into each other to simulate on field. The volunteer is on field data collected. The N5 concussions, 98 plus or minus 27 G's. Volume up to 105, 105 plus or minus 27 G's. So these numbers here are identical. You have a lot of confidence when you have two completely different studies that give the same answer that you have a very, very good idea of what level concussions start to happen at. What patients? So this plot I showed again with Dr. Margulies of DAI up on the far right, even if it's been lower. Here's the NFL and all the volunteers. So this is rotational velocity, rotational acceleration. Very agreement with the kind of rotations we're seeing relative to concussion. Uh, Jolly 4,500. All primate studies, NFL and volunteers coalescing around the same rotational acceleration levels. So research, cadavers, dummies, primates, and volunteers, I think it's very reasonable to say that the evidence shows that, yes, head acceleration is correlated with concussion risk. Now, I'd note to that, uh, which is, if you look at head injuries and concussions in the head, uh, the end study, 25 concussions, and the volunteer data set, we have 105. Every of these concussions is a head impact about getting hit in the head. Non-impact related symptoms can happen. You can have its impact and you can have concussion-like symptoms, but these are extremely rare and not the problem, not the main problem, not 99% of the problem. So the final question uh, or the session, do helmets differ in their ability to reduce head acceleration? Talk three different ways of testing. This picture of a standard noxy style test. Uh, you put helmets on, you measure acceleration, different heights, different drop tests. And I want an example, and I brought a present for you. I'll pass around. Um, this is the I'm going to give you. This is Both of these are noxy certified. On the left is the Adams helmet, and on the right is the Rydell 360. Uh, and you can see different type of padding. I'll just pass that around. And they keep that, so don't don't say I ever, didn't ever give you anything. So let these look like in a standard test. 60 drop on the top of the helmet. So as you look at this, you can look at the top relative padding in these two helmets. The helmet is in the eye of 1134, and the red L60 is 416. Helmets give you decelerations to the same energy input. Uh, so what if we talk about this in terms of Gs, which we think about more often uh, in our safety biomechanics? The atom is 190 Gs for a top head impact. The right 60 lowers that to 84 Gs. Dramatically different uh, accelerant profiles, and the reason our group in particular says that these helmets are not equal. But it's our research, uh, we can use the linear impactor, which is much more complicated. Uh, it's a hybrid three head and neck, measures linear and rotational acceleration. I won't detail, but the NFL has tested the heck out of these helmets. And look, there's three publications, Viana 2006, 11A, and 11B, where they had differences in helmets' ability to modulate linear as well as rotational. Some helmets are better than others at reducing linear and rotational acceleration. And it's four of the 17, so it's a significant improvement in the reduction of both of these head accelerations. So the data out there. Moving step a little more complicated, and I won't do the whole STAR system, 
But what we do is we take the acceleration and we apply it by exposure. We take all those different drop tests, or if you want to use a linear impactor, and for each one you multiply it by, by the frequency that, that player would see on the field. If you think about cap, it's the same thing. Plus the time you get in a full accident, we just apply each impact times how often that player would see it. And we have very differences from the 60 which we're passing around and the atoms what we rec not recommended. The difference, especially between these top five star and lower performing uh, helmets. Thank you. Clearly, our data, the NFL data, show that helmets differ in their ability to reduce head acceleration. Now, last question, what's most common? Are there clinical data that actually support the you see your concussions on the field? There's three studies, and I'm going to again focus on the Rydell Revolution and the VSR4 because they're very popular. They're in the field for a long, long time. The NFL Revolution, their top group, VSR4. Second, we had four stars to Revolution and one for the VSR4. 2006 paper, 2,000 high school students reduced concussions by 31% using the better helmet. Five of these comments are positive. I'm going to have to get through all this, but Dr. Cantu's letter said, this isn't their study because the VSR4 are older helmets, therefore they perform less. Uh, Oliver and myself would agree that this is not supported by the evidence. Uh, paper, there's no data set that show older helmets perform less well as newer helmets. In fact, our data shows that the more you hit these helmets, they get a little softer and they get a little better. They're very stiff out of the box. Uh, so the older helmet is so much worse than a new helmet, that's not true. But this study that we published in the fall, uh, looked at just Virginia Tech players. A nice study at Virginia Tech, we had older helmets because we go through about five helmets every year. You know, white, maroon, camouflaged, and they're all auctioned off. So everyone's playing with a new helmet all the time. We position and we go for exposure because we have instrumentation. So we don't worry about comparing kickers to the middle linebackers because we can account for every single time each player is hit in the head. Statistically significant risk reduction, 85%. Here's where in the revolution versus the VSR4. This elicits the previous criticisms and accounts for all the exposure. The third we're working on now, and I can't give you the details because we want to write to public. Uh, we're setting up 13 college team data. They're all in there. They all have new helmets. They all have medical oversight. And mission significantly reduces your risk of concussion across all these schools. So the evidence is yes, you do difference. Five few slides on our, our youth study. Uh, as mentioned before, about 70% of the players playing football are between 6 and 13 years. We have four coming out. Uh, they'll be out before this committee's reports due, so you'll be able to look at this. It's, it characterizes the exposure from 7 to 18 years. This is a partnership, three teams at Virginia Tech, three teams with our partners at Wake Forest. We instrumented the players. We collected all the uh, techniques, neuropsych tests throughout the course of a season. Sets of accelerometers system, as well as our six stop to, to cross correlate. Student filming each game and each practice and collecting data. There you go. There you go. The one you'll notice is the kids' helmets are big and they're almost always head to head impacts. Get their shoulder up. There are a lot of head to head impacts. This area that we want to work on, I think Dr. Guskowitz will follow it next. Uh, one of the found is that all the high hits, for the most part, occur in practice, and they incur drills that look just like this. One. So things that we're finding is that it's important to apply the scientific process to this. Before that study, everyone would say a six and a seven year old couldn't hit hard enough to get above a 10G impact. Clearly, can. we have a vast amount of opportunity to work with the coaches and the rules to get rid of some of those drills because we can show now that that's when you have the high hits. We looked at this, we collected over 34,000 impacts. We had concussions. So, we're going to start to build that database on what level you see concussion at these lower, lower range kids. Those five points, 62 references, and I'll be happy to take questions. You can just stay up there. Thank you very much. We can take Susan 
Margulies' question first, and she was referenced a number of times. Great presentation. You summarized a tremendous amount of data. I have a, a couple of questions. What with the, um, the plot of the data that you have from the NFL and the volunteers, where you imposed it on top of some older data, and there were remarked before in your presentations and in your papers about the tremendous variability in terms of um, a challenge in finding thresholds. So it would be very helpful for the committee to know where in those blobs were the recorded concussions. Blobs that were above and below the line, and there were a, a minority of the of the impacts that you reported. Any concussion associated with them? Put the slide up again, Susan. So go ahead. Thank you. Margulies, it's a very good question, and the need comes down to risk, and. And that's why we make the point, when we talk about thresholds, we're talking about an acceptable risk or a defined risk, whether it's 10%, 15%. What Dr. Margulies is pointing out with this slide, so the red and blue, those are concussion impacts, so you have rotational velocity and acceleration, volunteer and NFL data set. But I think the important point here is not every impact at that level causes a concussion. Actually, quite a percentage. So you look at risk. You have to about defining risk. And at 2,500 to 5,000, you're at a low risk, 1 to 5 percent. When you start to get above 7,500 to 10,000, you should get to 80, 90 percent. So as you move through that blob, if you will, uh, increase your risk. And we define that because we have all the instrumentation and we have all the hits that didn't cause concussion. So this is the injury data set. If you overlaid your non injury, you'd have a lot of impacts in that. That's where when we, we talk about. Uh, adding to the uh, uh, sort of a curve where you're 1% percent in 25 and 50. So you start to increase your risk as you increase those accelerations. Part of my question? question. Yeah, my question has to do with the challenge that you talked about in terms of determining whether a concussion has occurred. The unporting, the uh, it's very when you comment about the challenge, it's also the challenge in defining whether an a concussion has occurred so we can define mechanics of the conditions associated with those concussions. Absolutely, the underreporting, the defining, the clinical diagnosis of concussion is is a very difficult question, uh, and that's why have to, you know, think about, you know, consistency and who's diagnosing and what the level and what they're calling a concussion. You know, what we call concussion now is certainly different than it was 15 years ago. Um, what we do is look at what's available. Uh, we talk about underreporting in the one out of two. Uh, now I think the recent data shows underreporting that maybe we're missing nine out of ten. Uh, I want to categorize concussion all the way down to the very lowest level. You know, not including the people that are loss of consciousness. If you include the dizzy one symptoms, maybe we're only getting one out of ten. So these equations, we incorporate the best data to try to account for the fact that there are quite a bit of under-reporting in the, in the concussion sample. Dr. Kevin Kokalz, Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> we clearly charged with youth concussion and a lot of the research that you've done on and even the videos you show, show kids in new helmets. And you've talked about Dr. Cantu saying new helmets versus old helmets, and then talk about, well, the softening of the helmet may make it better. Is there evidence? I know there's no evidence showing a new helmet is better than an old one. Is there evidence saying that an old one could be better, at least as equivalent to a new one? And then evidence on reconditioning shelf life of helmets. How long do we keep kids in them? My is there's evidence to answer that question. Uh, and trust me, I've searched surged. There's no paper, there's no study that show any kind of performance as a function of 
age. Because there's a lot of other variables. Does it sit on the shelf? Is a five-year-old helmet that never got used is the same as a five-year-old helmet that got used a lot? We actually thought we had a great chance to do this because we knew how many times these helmets were used. The problem is we don't have any of those because they auction them off. So we have this historical that which we could actually answer that question. So for instance, there's what we from our new helmet testing is that over the course of 10 to 15 to 20, you see a little drop off. So it gets a little better. Uh, my point is that there's no data to suggest that a five-year-old helmet is any worse or better than a new helmet. It just isn't there. And it's an area for research. Christy Arbogast, Children's Hospital, Philadelphia. Nice summary, Stefan. I want to from one of Susan's questions about injury outcome. And so your collegiate data, you have no control over that because you've got a team physician who, in, in theory, has the same practice. Right. In diagnosis, when you're involving many youth teams, of which medical coverage is probably varied, sporadic, how do you ensure that those injury outcomes are all being assessed the same way? That's a question, Christy. It is a real challenge dealing with seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids. Uh, First time playing football, and a lot of them aren't happy about that in a general sense. Um, so we did is we we. Everything funneled to two positions. So the teams we had near Virginia Tech funneled to Dr. Bolson, who's our head team physician, and we gave out flyers to all the parents and the grad students who watched the game so we could modulate that, so we could ensure there was one diagnosis. Obviously, we can't do that two hours away, so we had a second position, Dr. Alex Powers at Wake Forest, where those three teams funneled to him so that at least the diagnosis and the treatment was consistent uh, as much as we could control. I can't do it one for both sides. But we tried to make everyone came together so that there was a consistent level because it's very you know physician to physician and grading and um, it's a good when question. When did the kids interact with those two physicians because they aren't on field for all games? Right, they? right. So they're all, all the, they're not late reporting. You know there will be symptoms maybe on the field uh, and they would go so it would be hours, you right. know, hour to a day uh, before they got to that, that position. Okay. Um, a second question. Your statement about all. The injuries came from head to head impact. Right. That's based on football alone. Correct. Not on other sports. Right. Okay. Last question. Children's National Medical Center. A great presentation, Stefan. I, I I was just struck by your last statement with the young kids uh, again returning to the anatomy, the uh, body surface to mass index of those kids is most of their most most of their contact area is their head. Right. So I'm, I'm curious about your last statement about um, uh, techniques, training techniques to maybe obviate what we saw in your in your film, and that that's a, a realistic proposition given um, how much of the contact area is the head in, in young kids. Question: If you look at the exposure data, you know these kids, it's all in the front. Uh, you know, the run on fall, and my front of my head's hitting whatever I hit. Uh, the one thing I know we can change is we can get rid of those, some of those drills. Uh, that are like the one we showed you. There's no reason to run that. But the interesting thing was, you know, and these coaches are trying, and they're all they all have their jobs. And um, but it's all anecdotal. You know, no one's ever sat down and said, "Look at this." You know, you're in a drill where you're giving these kids 80 Gs, and you never see it in the game. It doesn't happen because they never are able to run up. It's always diagonal. So I think there's a opportunity there, and I think Gaskell will go into that. And that's why we always say this is the, the first second. Opportunities, you know, change rules, change the uh, behavior. Obviously, you can't get the head all the time. Maybe we need to talk about: Do we need to play football at seven, eight years old? Uh, maybe that needs to be modulated until you can control that. Uh, but I think one of the key questions is: We have to collect the data so that we can make informed decisions. Thank you very much. And it's a, a great segue to our next speaker, Dr. Kevin Guskowitz. Um, Dr. Guskowitz is the chair of Exercise and Sports Science Department at UNC and the director of the Geffler Sport-Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center there. And, and just let me also say that Kevin um, was very instrumental in this whole sport happening. He with me and Kimber Bogart to really try to um, move this thing forward and really very excited for him for doing that. So, Kevin? Great. I just want to thank the committee uh, for the invitation to be here today. So, 
uh, what I'm going to try to do, and, and I want to commend uh, Dr. Duma on a great presentation, and I think this is a good segue because it's going to, I think, take more than, than just equipment and helmets to, to solve this uh, problem. And so I think we're really here today to talk about uh, what are the risks, uh, how do we uh, modify those risks, uh, minimize those risks, and what might the cumulative risks be for uh, youth athletes and on the committee's hard at work in this area. And should kids be playing contact, contact or collision sports? And I'm, I hope that at the end of the day that uh, we'll agree that, yes, they, uh, they, they can uh, be, could be if we, if we manage this in the right way and if we can come together uh, as scientists, clinicians, coaches, parents, uh, and athletes to try to solve the problem. Uh, I have three boys, uh, all three uh, play contact sports, and some when you do what you do, how can you allow that? <laughs> but I have faith that uh, we're going to, you know, that we're in this in the right way, and I think that uh, a lot that can be gained by participation in sport, and uh, that includes collision sport, and that's developing character, and I think uh, just uh, providing an environment for real life situations for how kids uh, can uh, learn to make corrections. So part of sport is uh, practicing, adjusting, practicing more, and adjusting. So with that, though, uh, we have a, uh, the responsibility as a society to be sure that we're doing this in the right way. So back in 1996, when the Surgeon General uh, called for more physical activity, promotion of more physical activity to try to combat childhood obesity and, di and diabetes, uh, the, what we found was that we maybe, as a society, we weren't quite prepared for this. How do we uh, increase sport activity while minimizing the risk of injury, and so management of this injury while promoting uh, physical activity? And so uh, this is sort of where uh, we, we are headed. And I think uh, for the first time in uh, two days this past year, we actually saw a laying off and a slight decrease in the um, incidence of childhood obesity. Uh, in, in the U.S. There's a report published back in November on this. So uh, we need to keep kids active. So I'm going to talk about how rules changes can influence this and how um, uh, training techniques and, and uh, um, for kids how to uh, play uh, safer might uh, contribute to this along with equipment. So I want to credit a good uh, friend and colleague of mine, Don Comstock. Uh, who heads up the high school Rio project. It's an injury surveillance program. I'm going to show you two slides of how injury surveillance uh, already made a difference. So this is new, relatively new data that Don's allowed uh, for me to, uh, to show today. And uh, it shows over the, over the past seven years uh, the, on high school uh, punts, kickoffs, and then just general plays, so standard offensive, defensive plays. And what this slide represents is the percentage of competitive injuries that were concussions. So what Portion of all, all injuries or concussions. Well, you can see that uh, on the punt and the kickoff, it's a relatively uh, high percentage that were. Um, uh, what's important was that in 2007 2008, the National Federation of State High School Associations was considering moving the kickoff uh, back, as the NFL and the uh, NCAA just did, to prefer a more open, uh, wide open game. Uh, they took back, said, let's take some time to look at the data and uh, made a very smart decision not to do that, to try to uh, uh, allow it to be more often kicked into the end zone to prevent a, a return. This, you can look at the data just in, a, in another way here, uh, again, the high school road data, and this is simply looking at the percentage of all concussions and what types of plays they occurred on. So essentially on the kickoff, uh, 15 to 16 percent, if you look at the bottom row there, were on kickoff. So that would, if there were no uh, association between the risk of a concussion and the play type, um, then would be kicking off about one out of every six plays would be a kickoff. And we know that's not the case in football. So it's been identified as a dangerous play. Let's look at taking some data, uh, college data. Fortunately, the, NCAA, the National Federation did not move with that, that rule. Uh, look at uh, some college data, and this was published uh, in ABME using the accelerometer system that Dr. Duma produced uh, or provided for us uh, some excellent data on a few minutes ago. And we published this paper looking at college players and the average linear acceleration highlighted in red there uh, shows that uh, a, it was the play type where uh, punts and kickoffs uh, where the impact was made with the two players running uh, at 10 yards before colliding and it had the high average linear acceleration of any other play type. So again, for evidence to suggest this is probably one of the more, uh, if not the most dangerous play in the sport of football. Uh, what are the do well uh, two years ago they, they took uh, 
have been wanting to change the kickoff rule. Uh, they took uh, some of this data and said, uh, we, you know, that we now have evidence to suggest that we might kick the, uh, change the kickoff rule. And uh, what, uh, what transpired then after one season, uh, this is looking at the 2011 data, uh, there was a 30% uh, reduction in the number of returned kickoffs during the 2011 season compared to the three seasons leading up to the 2011 season. And that resulted then, if you look at the gray or shaded area here, a 42% reduction in the number of concussions sustained in the league that one year uh, on the kickoff. I uh, was really pleased to hear from talking to Tim Kelly today earlier uh, that the NCAA, we know, followed up with a similar rule change uh, a year after this uh, data was presented. And uh, it sounds as if they're seeing a similar trend uh, in the NCAA in terms of the reduction of uh, concussion. So this is an example of how injury surveillance and rule changes can, in fact, uh, be a game changer. So let's flip over to hockey for a minute. Uh, this work was funded by Noxie and USA Hockey and uh, a few years ago, uh, using a similar accelerometer system in youth hockey, plus Bantam age hockey players. And what we found is we published this paper, a colleague of mine uh, at UNC, Jason Mihalik, uh, we found that illegal collisions, uh, those that involved elbowing, elbowing, intentional head contact, or high sticking, 17% uh, of all body collisions, these illegal, illegal collisions resulted in higher linear and rotational acceleration relative to uh, legal collisions. And you might say, well, there's not a big difference between 23 and 21 Gs. Probably not, but if you add this up over the course of a uh, season or several seasons, it may uh, be meaningful. Uh, concluded that uh, athletes and coaches should conform more to the rules. Officials should be more stringent in enforcing and assessing uh, more severe penalties to players who purposely foul an opponent. If you saw a paper from back in 1993 where uh, the, the uh, fair play in, in hockey uh, was a program put in place to award uh, teams, youth teams, Bantam age teams, uh, points for, for minimized contact. So at the end of the season, they awarded points in the standings because of uh, fair play. Uh, this uh, program, I, I'm, I'm still, and maybe Alan can help later tell me more about where this program is today, but... Uh, what we found out of this study in 93 was that uh, by instituting a, a program such as this, there were 30% fewer penalties, 25% fewer game suspensions in Bantam level fair play teams compared to their non program uh, counterparts. Also, uh, we saw just 70% of the fair play teams didn't receive a single game suspension, which uh, at that time uh, in the early 90s uh, this apparently was fairly common. So, inter that reward proper behavior can, in fact, minimize illegal uh, conduct and severe misconduct for more uh, likely to cause injury. So here is now to, to training. And uh, how can uh, we... So again, I hope what I've tried to illustrate is that there are ways in which uh, rule changes can, in fact, be uh, influential here in preventing uh, injury. You probably have heard that there's been many individuals calling, I shouldn't say many, there have been individuals calling for uh, uh, putting age limits on this. I've been uh, opposed to this because I think there's a better way. Uh, first of all, I don't know what that age should be. We, there's far more that we don't know than, than, we, uh, than we do know. And um, if you think that this uh, proposition, which we've already heard about today, skin practice, on the field exposure, changing the sport culture. We've heard a little about this all day, and we're going to uh, hear more uh, later. But this uh, sort of allows for uh, early development of the skills that we think can, in fact, help an individual uh, in life when those collisions may, in fact, be more, more uh, injurious or more dangerous, high-risk behaviors. So um, well, why start young? Well, uh, as Dr. Duma just said, we don't know. Maybe we should think about eliminating it at, at six, seven years old. Uh, but why has 14 or 15 been selected? Uh, that's the age at which we begin to see great disparity in terms of size and, and weight of individuals when they begin to play middle school, high school uh, football. What we know if you jump into the motor learning literature is that a lot can be gained uh, in terms of developing neuromotor skills starting uh, at an appropriate age. And how we might then protect uh, ourselves or 
or at least the, the protect uh, the, the youth athletes that are trying to play contact sports. A number of published papers on this topic. And, uh, basically, we think that skill exposure at younger age promotes the neuroanatomy uh, supportive uh, for skill expertise and injury prevention. And there are papers that have, in fact, shown this. Not necessarily papers that are specific to neuro preventing neurotrauma, but in fact, developing the motor skills that we think can help position body. Uh, you to acquire the right, right types of uh, skills to, to, to use uh, all of your um, um, What's happening during this age? Well, we know that the brain's undergoing a drastic change during those adolescent years just with respect to the way myelination of the brain is occurring. With this, uh, uh, the adolescence uh, presents really this optimal window for skill development and acquisition. Uh, the brain changing with respect to its hardwiring, the, the plasticity and it is improving, and uh, we sort of have this uh, opportunity for maximal development of these motor skills. And so, uh, again, not specific necessarily preventing concussion. I think that this all goes hand in hand. If you look at slide, looking at neuromuscular performance across the lifespan, so from infancy up to adulthood, and uh, look at what happens when we sort of uh, begin to train individuals. So we see this uh, so greater improvement in performance when the skill exposure and training is initiated at an earlier uh, earlier within development. And then for during adolescence and adulthood, this optimal performance that's achieved. And these are, have been shown in, in a, a number of prospective studies uh, that, in my opinion, I think uh, allow for uh, the individual to again protect themselves from injury uh, when they're participating, uh, when when they be more important uh, in the high school uh, years. <clears throat> in a point one study uh, by Carolyn, who's a, a sports epidemiologist out of Canada, out, out of Canada, uh, Carolyn does uh, some excellent work in this area, and she published this paper in 2011. And what's interesting, and I know it's a busy slide with a lot of numbers here, but in the uh, left hand. Uh, column uh, here, we uh, uh, bandage players in hockey, age 13 and 14, who have uh, previous body checking experience during the 11 to 12 year old window of play. Uh, those two are compared or contrasted against a group of banded hockey players at age 13 to 14 who had no previous body checking experience. They played in a league where they did not allow the body checking or at least the, the and trained on how to protect themselves. And if you know, again, all these incidence rates, these are uh, showing this per uh, 1,000 player hours. You can see that the numbers and the, the incidence rates in the right-hand column, in many cases, and, and concussion, uh, you can see here, it's, it's higher uh, relative, uh, to the group that learned how to check. So this is to, looking at them two years later after they were allowed to check and train and and, and practice this, this. Um, so the, the decreased, um, relative speaking, injury rates. What they concluded here is that uh, not the entire uh, in here, essentially a 33% reduction in uh, the more serious injuries uh, among them hockey players who played in the league where body checking was allowed. So they trained to be able to play that game at a later age. So just one example of where I think uh, then make it. So we've heard a bit about cervical neck strengthening. So why might some athletes be at a greater risk? Well, everybody, uh, many people point to this, the, the uh, difference in cervical neck strength uh, among the uh, year athletes and uh, the, the female athletes. Uh, we uh, understudied, and it's hard to believe that it's been so understudied. Uh, the woodpecker, in fact, has been more studied, I think, than the human with respect to this. And we know that the woodpecker has a, a very uh, interesting, uh, very dense, long strap-like neck musculature uh, relative to its um, head and, and body type relative to humans, which is why apparently they aren't concussed. Uh, uh, back to the humans. Uh, so strength training, we know, uh, can change muscle structure and strength. A number of published studies on this topic. Uh, may not be a matter of pure strength is what we're learning, but perhaps cervical power may in fact be uh, where we need to be focused. In other words, how quickly uh, the time at which uh, an individual can reach peak uh, uh, to sort of dissipate uh, the acceleration of the head. And so there's been some work recently in this area. 
and uh, Julianne Schmidt, uh, my current uh, doctoral student, and I are uh, in the midst of a project, her dissertation, in fact, that is, hasn't shown, and we will be publishing on this uh, over the next uh, six to eight months, that low cervical strength uh, is associated with increased risk of sustaining moderate to severe impacts relative to a group of high school football players who uh, have uh, fallen into this high cervical neck strengthening group. So clearly, uh, this can make a difference, and I think we need to do more with this. And patient, the ability to withstand this impact is also important, has been uh, studied. Uh, going back to the work of, of my colleague, Jason Mihalik, and again, this was funded uh, by Noxie and USA Hockey, looking at how do uh, hockey players, Bantam hockey players, be able to anticipate that impact, uh, respond uh, uh, relative to those who uh, who are both decided, uh, upon and we published this paper in Pediatrics in 2010, essentially finding that open ice collisions uh, result in higher linear and rotational acceleration, uh, collisions along the boards, that unanticipated collisions, uh, and this was a very time-intensive project, which uh, we, we reviewed a, uh, a little video footage. And, um, the anticipated collisions resulted in higher linear and rotational acceleration versus the anticipated collisions, which led us to conclude that we really need to work more closely with, with youth uh, athletes, uh, teaching them the proper technical skills to heighten their awareness uh, of these sort of imminent collisions and mitigate the severity of head impacts in hockey. We know that in NHL now that they have uh, banned sort of these uh, one-sided impacts and uh, the jury's still out in terms of what it's going to meet in terms of reducing the, the concussion incidents, but I think that we'll see that it will in fact make a difference. Uh, one study uh, sort of looks at this same issue of anticipation. This was a recent study published um, by Lincoln um, showing that video incident analysis uh, in, in a boys' high school cross, uh, if we look at the conclusions here, that uh, when they went back and looked at a lot of video, I'm going to just add that I think video footage uh, is underutilized in terms of teaching the proper techniques and the injury risks in, in our youth athletes. Uh, it's rare to go to a uh, youth game, what the sport is, where there's not at least 50 parents in the in the stands videotaping their child or their uh, teammates, uh, and this to be uh, utilized, in my opinion. What they found in this study was that uh, injured players were most often um, aware of the pending contact, uh, and a striking player used uh, his head to initiate contact. So again, two things here that could easily be uh, trained. Uh, I think we need more research and focus on uh, on our senses, visual uh, training is really important. We're doing some work in this area, and I think that we're going to find that by uh, teaching young athletes to utilize the sensory inputs, be able to anticipate injury uh, or the impact, uh, activating cervical muscle, uh, uh, the muscle to help protect the head, and uh, seeing how that influences head impact severity, I think that this is really going to make a difference. This shows uh, just in one way how we are uh, using uh, these deaths that look at level of anticipation. Again, it's very time intensive, but looking at proper body positioning and uh, then working with the athletes, keeping them uh, in the lab. Them these, this is data from uh, the HIT system that Dr. Duma presented earlier, showing 31 total impacts in one game, linking it to the video footage. And uh, really call this is behavior modification. It's about putting this data in front of them, uh, showing how they could in fact improve. So in conclusion, what we we know, uh, youth athletes are safer when taught the proper techniques and fundamentals of their respective sports at the appropriate age. We need more data to support this, which is why I say this is what we think we know and not necessarily what we do know. Uh, when parents and youth athletes are taught effective concussion recognition and response, youth play safer. There's a, an evolving uh, literature on this, and I think the state concussion laws that are out there are going to help. We're going to see this uh, holding true. Unnecessary contact in youth sports needs to be limited uh, for safer play. Uh, pop football is doing this today. Uh, they've, mi they've minimized the amount of uh, contact in a given week, uh, only a third of the time to be uh, devoted to contact uh, during any practice. Continue what we think we know, uh, rule enforcement uh, of unsafe behavior that puts the head and, uh, at risk for injury must be put to action. Uh, unfortunately, there's no consensus by medical experts for uh, a specific, as I've already mentioned, uh, kids are safe, 
safer in playing contact sports. But I, I do believe that we need to um, stop, uh, we need prospective studies, and we need to think about how we can make a difference with this. What we don't know, uh, some thresholds uh, all over the place. Uh, how do you look at uh, why vary from one person to the next? We just, uh, again, more needs to be done. Uh, if playing contact sports for any uh, number of years makes someone more susceptible to CTE, we just don't know right, right now. Uh, if some playing standards for youth sports are safer, uh, but we're uh, gaining uh, more evidence uh, in this area. And finally, where do we go from here? I think we need to put more emphasis on coaching education, teaching the fundamentals the right way, uh, cognition and response uh, for parents, coaches, players, and interesting uh, contact. But I want to underscore the importance here, not eliminating it when it's part of the game. And I think these are going to need to be able to protect themselves uh, at a later date uh, if they're going to continue to play the sport. Utilizing instructional tools, uh, of which there are many out there, the heads up on tackling that USA Football has put out is excellent. I encourage you to look at this if you haven't. Identifying predispositions to concussion through injury surveillance and epidemiological studies, track head impacts to identify high-risk behaviors, enforcing the rules and modifying behavior to protect the head. And finally, uh, we need better science. We need funding. I hope something that will come out of this meeting will be more funding uh, to advance our understanding of this, and uh, we'll then be able to make recommendations based on, on science. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin. Dr. Casey. Hi, Dr. Casey. Wow, Cornell. Okay. It's on. It's on. Um, so I just wanted to ask you on these studies. Um, thank you very much for that um, nice overview. And the studies talk about age of acquisition, um, perhaps being protected at some level. Um, can you really dissociate that from the amount of training the individual gets? Because presumably, the earlier they start, the more hours they've spent learning um, the actual sport. Is it some uh, uh, is it hard wiring, the muscle memory, that's that's it, uh, training them to protect themselves, to position themselves better, or is it just the the, the repetition uh, because they've been doing it for longer periods of time. Is that, that sort of where we are with it? Again, the, the three studies that I, uh, for, for, for this conclusion, I haven't looked at it uh, in, in that way, but I think it's an excellent point. We need to look to see whether it is just the, uh, I think it has more to do with the advantage that we have at that, uh, the absence of that window. You, 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 you don't think so? <laughs> so, other questions? In, in terms of that same question, are there, do you think there are gender differences besides age differences? The difference in terms of the risk of injury or the ability to actually and modify behavior? The ability to, to train and modify. Yeah, I think that um, if, if you look at the, the data, the, the, there clearly is an evolving uh, literature suggesting that the female athlete is more susceptible to concussion. Uh, the reported concussion incidences are higher among uh, female athletes, and Comstock again is showing this through her Rio data. And the, the question is, are they um, behavioral? Um, and some behavioral literature would suggest that they're more willing to report their injuries that that uh, less uh, and and uh, um, ages and, and up through the high school years that they're uh, more in tune with with their bodies and willing to uh, to sort of recognize that they've have in fact had the injury more in tune with the symptoms and uh, I think that there's uh, I do think that there's a gender factor that to be considered as we as we look at this and I think if you look at the data that would suggest that they're probably uh, going to more um, able to uh, modify the behavior um, there's Russian uh, study looking at aggression as well uh, that as a factor and a modifier of this ability to do this that's being studied. Thanks. You're from uh, Geisel School of Medicine. Dartmouth. Um, you before and um, talked about the number of concussions that sort of seem problematic and the increasing problems, more concussions you get. And Bob Cantu came out and said, you know, we've got to get kids to quit playing contact. I thought that's what you are going to talk about. Um, but if you look at now, 
a 12 year four concussions, would you say they should stop? You, would you, um, you know, they're playing in middle school football. Is that, is that me? I mean, I think it's a matter of going back to to understand what is predisposing that individual to those repetitive concussions. I mean, four concussions uh, for a high school athlete, I would certainly sit them down for a uh, tab. I mean, our cl clinic, we, we see uh, a number of injuries like that. Sitting them down, the question is, is it, is, is it you're done? Uh, or are we sitting them and trying to modify behavior, trying to give them that adequate rest time for the neuroprotective, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of, of just saying, you know, again, that it should be this age, 14, 15, 16, and shouldn't play. Um, I think that we need to identify uh, what those predispositions, predispositions of the injury are. What is causing this individual to have repetitive concussion? Well, so, um, that, that's sort of the, the thing parents come to me with is, is Mike is 12 and he's had three concussions. Um, should he be going? And so there's an age limit on it, but would it? Does it make more sense to put umber limit on it? And is the your view is the data there yet, or are we still sort of just getting there? Uh, again, you know that if you look at the uh, the data published, looking at just with NFL players that that have three or more prior concussions or at a uh, five risk of developing um, mild term impairment after age 50, those that have three uh, or at a, a threefold risk of developing. Uh, Depression, developing depression at some point after age 50. So uh, three is the number that's in my mind. Uh, and again, uh, the question is how close in succession do they happen? I think that's a that's a factor. Um, if my child had this is the way I answer it, I talk to parents a little time. Counseling is a big part of what we do. If, if my daughter had three concussions in a short period of time, uh, I would pull them uh, definitely and. Uh, Pick another sport and uh, try to at least modify that uh, what it is that they're that that, that is earlier is causing the you know them to to be injured. What was motocross? But I see some of those in the hospital. Yeah, I mean it's uh, these are typically more moderate to severe TBIs that we worry about out there. Um, it's, it's certainly something we need to be concerned about. Uh, I mentioned earlier. We can't just fly on the helmet to solve this problem. Uh, that's of high velocity injuries that motor, motocross experiences. The helmet certainly make a difference in terms of mitigating the, those high velocity uh, impact forces. So, uh, like I mean, I think that I would, you know, I don't say that many motocross concussion, you know, related to the motocross in a short period of time that would pull. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. So it looks we have a 15-minute break. Please come back at 2.45, and then we'll be hearing perspectives of families, coaches, and officials.
Got us really coming.
sound to your biggest player to support? When you're removed from actually playing, and you see the first five minutes of the game, all of these players are trying to figure out what the going to cost me. Thank you. 